My name is Chris Coyne, and I'm the F.A. Harper Professor of Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University and the Associate Director of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics. Today I'm joined by Robert Higgs, who is a Senior Fellow in Political Economy at the Independent Institute and is the Editor-at-Large of the Institute's quarterly journal, The Independent Review. Bob, welcome. Thank you very much, Chris. Another related theme in, in Christ and Leviathan that I think is very important that you emphasize is this notion of institutional possibilities. Uh, and so even when you have some retrenchment, uh, things lay dormant. Uh, yes. There's a precedent there. Right. In some cases, there's an actual bureaucratic apparatus, which might shrink slightly, but it's there still. Yes. Uh, and, and when that will emerge again is unknowable. It might be years, it might be decades. Um, and you know, the NSA is a, a very good example of that. Um, you know, it was created in the 50s, but you know, its history is much further back than that. Mm -hmm. uh, no one could have predicted at the time yeah. how it would look in the um, post 9-11 world. Now, uh, I'm curious what you think about, uh, what, with what you just said about the, the post 9-11 world, because where many of the national emergencies that you discuss in Christ and Leviathan seem to have somewhat of a clear endpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, it, right now, the United States is engaged in a, a, a war that has no clear end, numerous wars that have mm -hmm. no clear end. Mm -hmm. uh, the main one, what, what people call the war on terror, but that's linked up with the war on drugs and all the other ongoing wars. Right. Um, so, so how do you see that fitting into to your framework um, in terms of the fact that there, you know, it's unclear that there'll ever be a retrenchment or, or a clear end point, because it's unclear what victory even means. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it's a very troubling development. Uh, uh, I think you know, one needs to understand that in all of these episodes, there were people who didn't want the retrenchment, even after uh, an episode such as World War II. There were people, for example, who didn't want the government to abandon its price controls, for example, at the, at the end of the war. Uh, there were always people, sometimes the those who managed the government agencies and sometimes outsiders who benefited from the operations of these agencies who wanted to keep the government doing whatever it had done for a war purpose uh, or an anti-depression purpose during the uh, New Deal, for example. Uh, so there are, there are always uh, people in or close to the government uh, who would like to have the government operate at a higher level that is reached as a result of emergency actions. Uh, now, the, the question in the past has always been, can, can the people who want to keep the government operating at this extraordinary level succeed? Because there are others who, who want tr retrenchment. They want, they want to get rid of, for example, price controls in 1945. There, a lot of businessmen then were sick of price controls. They didn't like to file reports with the Office of Price Administration. They didn't like to have people snooping on the prices they charge or interfering with how much they, they, could, they could charge customers. Uh, so there was a lot of opposition to keeping the price controls. Now, uh, if we come up to the, the present and the, uh, and the post 9-11 uh, developments, uh, we, we have in a way a similar uh, give and take there. We, we have some people who, who, who want to keep the government operating at a, at a very high uh, level of action overseas, uh, just as the, the government used 9-11 as a pretext for attacking Iraq and occupying the country for over a decade. And of course, U.S. forces remain in Iraq even now, although in diminished numbers. But uh, U.S. forces operating still in Afghanistan, as they, they have since immediately after 9-11, uh, operating in many other parts of the world. So supposedly because of, uh, of the threat that was manifested on 9-11. Uh, now, obviously, uh, some people think this is overwrought. They think this is inappropriate. They think uh, it's not con really connected with uh, the perpetrators of 9-11, they think the United States has used this as a pretext to become involved in foreign civil wars that are unrelated to, uh, to anything that happened in 9-11. Uh, so there, there is some uh, opposition to the idea that government should continue to do everything it did immediately after 9-11 on the basis of, of reacting to, to that horrible event. 
Uh, however, uh, the war on terror is an unusual kind of crisis uh, or reaction to crisis because uh, obviously conventional war has to end at some point. E even historically, the 30 years of war went on a long time, but it ended. The 100 years of war <laughs> ended. It took a long time. But if you have uh, uh, something like a war on terror, uh, it's not a war on a definite enemy. It's a war on a tactic, a tactic that can be carried out by virtually any, any adult. You or I could commit a terroristic act. Uh, we, we have automobiles. Uh, we could drive into a crowd and kill people. Uh, terrorism is available to almost anybody who wants to carry it out. Uh, it doesn't require that we blow up an airplane or, or a, a hotel or a government office. Uh, it can be done in a variety of ways uh, just to create terror. And uh, so the whole idea of fighting terror is senseless, basically. Now, it's always linked uh, in the past 15 years or so, it's always linked with with the uh, Islamist uh, radicals in uh, various parts of the Middle East and Africa and Asia uh, who have been, been characterized as the, uh, the great devils of the day, you know, the, uh, the threat du jour. Uh, we don't have Hitler anymore, we don't have Stalin anymore, but now we have Islamist fanatics. And uh, we don't know who they all are, where they are, what they plan to do, uh, we do know that there are some people in the world uh, who are intent on committing acts of terrorism against uh, Americans or Europeans or, in some cases, uh, Asians, Africans. Uh, there are some people that uh, would like to commit acts of terror in, uh, as part of a political program uh, to seek power in these places or, in many cases, to uh, eject American and other European forces from their countries. So uh, there's no doubt that there are terrorists and would-be terrorists in the world. But uh, that's been the case for a long time. Uh, and uh, terrorism can be and uh, would more profitably be treated as a form of crime. Uh, to treat it as a, a, a form of warfare in the same way that conventional warfare takes place uh, is a recipe for enlarging the state, uh, sacrificing people's liberties uh, in a quest that never ends, as you say. How can anyone ever be sure that terrorism has been defeated? It's not a foe. We can't kill every terrorist because some new terrorist could come into being at any moment. So uh, it's, a, uh, uh, it's an ideal uh, mission for those people who do not want retrenchments of government size, scope, and power and particularly for those people who enjoy or profit from the government's operation of the war on terror at a high level. We need to understand that it's not just the people who run the NSA or the CIA that gain from having a war on terror. It's also the many, many, many companies and consulting uh, firms that contract with uh, the Pentagon or the CIA or the NSA, uh, and there, there are thousands of them. Uh, uh, where people are earning large amounts of money for carrying out some research or some production activity uh, ostensibly related to uh, fighting the war on terror. And so this, uh, this activity now has built into it a very large and well-heeled uh, private sector of crony capitalists tied to the government agencies most responsible for conducting the war on terror. And for that reason, it's much harder to bring about a retrenchment. Every time some retrenchment is proposed, uh, the, the people who stand to gain from its continuation cry out that that would be uh, undesirable. It would uh, open us up to attack by enemies. It would, uh, it would place us at greater risk. Uh, we would be asking for harm. Uh, uh, which is a very cheap form of talk because they don't have to do much to justify it, but it's the kind of talk that has some effect. That's why they, they talk that way again and again and again. All crises managers uh, are familiar with using fear to manage the public. Uh, during crises, government wants to 
impose costs on the public in a way that it hasn't before, or uh, it wants to require them to take actions they weren't taking before. And in order to gain compliance, in order to get people to, to acquiesce in the government's exercise of these new powers at the expense of people's liberties, it needs to make them afraid. Uh, that's the best way to make them uh, desist from resistance uh, or evasion. So all crisis management is tied up with fear management. And uh, anybody who even watches uh, daily television programs knows there's a fear du jour. There's a fear almost every day. And practically every one of these fears has tied to it some government response or some proposal for a government response, whether it's a, a new epidemic on the horizon or a new jihadist group in uh, some far, far away part of the world. Uh, the solution or the response is always seen nowadays as some government response not just leaving it to other people to, to take care of it. So uh, I think the, the war on terror has been a, a, a disastrous development because of the way the US government and allied governments have responded to it uh, and because these responses have, among other things, had the effect of continually creating new terrorists. Every time the United States drops a rocket on a village in Yemen or Afghanistan, uh, they kill a lot of innocent people, and they, they make people who otherwise wouldn't have hated the United States and Americans enough to engage in terrorism, they make them hate the United States that much. They, the United States anti-terrorism program grows its own new crop of terrorists virtually every day.